This is the Sales Babble Podcast, episode 306, Raise Your Standards for Seven-Figure Sales, an interview with Mark Evans. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And now your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, Sales Babblers. This is Pat Helmers. And before I get started, I'd like to do a shout out to a few people who've had me on their podcast, specifically Brian Basilico, David Fisher, and Catherine Praisewater. And we have talked about all kinds of things in regarding to beer, beets, business, bacon, and the positive imprint that we've left on the world. Some of these people you've heard on the podcast, but I think you might find it pretty interesting to hear another person's view on what I'm all about. So if you go to salesbabble.com slash press, there's links to those podcasts. I highly recommend them. But for this episode, our guest is Mark Evans. He is the author of the new book, Raise Your Standards, The Definitive Guide to Building Seven-Figure Sales. And according to Mark, the old-fashioned can scripts and manipulative closing techniques just don't work. And he gives us advice on what does work. Now make sure and listen all the way to the end for Craig Klein's Sales Nexus Sales tip, which this week is follow-up, which is one of my favorite topics of all time. So, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Mark. Are you ready to babble? I'm ready. Let's do it. Mark, you got a new book out called Raise Your Standards, The Definitive Guide to Building Seven-Figure Sales. This is a new book, right? This is. It came out last week, Tuesday, the 19th of November, or the 20th of November. Jeez. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is a real achievement. What motivated you to write this book? Yeah, well, I guess it was a couple things. So for one, so I married an entrepreneur. So my wife, Katie, um, she runs a business along with her father-in-law. And um, she was really, their, their company's really rapidly growing and expanding and they were adding salespeople to it. Um, and at that time, this was a uh, March of 2018, um, she had called me a couple of times and said, hey, what do you do in this sales team situation. What do you do in this? And at that time, I was managing a sales and service team of about 75. We had grown it from, I think, like 12 the year or two previously. So some real rapid growth where we had to put some real foundational elements of managing a sales team in place. So she'd call me up and say, hey, what do you do in this situation? What should I do here? And so I would ramble and babble for like 20, 25 minutes or so. We're all about babbling on this uh, podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Well, then you'll love the book, right? Um, So she would take really good notes in those sections. And then one day, a couple of weeks later, she kind of handed me this document, right? Or I shouldn't say handed. She sent me this link. She said, hey, I've been taking really good notes. And she said, hey, I think you've got kind of a book here. I think you've got the initial starting of a book. And as I reviewed it, and as that entrepreneurial fire really started to grow inside me, uh, i just a, a quick story here. My parents are entrepreneurs. Their parents are entrepreneurs, married into a family of entrepreneurs. So that fire had always been in, in, um, alive with me as far as wanting to start and do my own thing. Once she handed me this book, then things really started escalating for me. I said, hey, you know, I, I got to start writing this and take this seriously. And so um, I started that in March of 2018. And then it just launched here uh, in the third week of November. What makes this book different from all the other sales books? Because I'm looking at a huge... I have a huge bookcase just filled with sales books. What, mm-hmm. makes, what makes this one different? Yeah, well, I think it's one of the first books to really talk about a couple of key elements that I don't think a lot of sales books are really discussing. So first, I kick it off with mindset, right? And so there's a lot of mindset. There's a lot of professional development books out there, but they don't pair it with the actual sales tactics and techniques, I think, that really um, help salespeople, right? Um, so I start with the the mindset principles. And I really think that if you're going to be successful, whether it's in life or whether it's in sales, you got to start with these mindset principles. And these were principles that I've acquired over my time. A lot of them I've borrowed from my mentors and bosses and people I really respect. And so when you pair that then with the actual tools and techniques of sales, right, and modern day selling um, of, you know, really coming up with strong cadences, how you're going to reach out to people, coming up and developing a really strong sales structure and communication platform, I think that's what really makes this book unique because people can use it right away. 
That's what I'm excited about because the listeners here on Sales Babble, although they like mindset, I think we kind of beat on that pretty awful lot. Of course, just to let you know, the mindset that we have here is like, how can I help you? How can I serve you? Mm -hmm. Listen hard and then, then speak how you can maybe help them. Yeah, you you got agreement from me there. <laughs> is there any is there anything on top of that that you would add that this book speaks to? Yeah, well, I mean, there's really right. So when I, when I break down kind of my sales methodology, it's a speaking exactly as that. I think first, what you really need to do is build a good relationship with people, right? You come in and you build some great rapport. And so I map this out in a four sales, um, like a four sales process. Um, guideline, if you will, right? So the first step is building some great rapport. Um, and now you can do this online too, right? It, rapport just doesn't happen have to happen in the conversation. But now you can utilize tools like um, email and social media like LinkedIn, right? To start building rapport even before you pick up that phone or even before you step foot in someone's office. So I think it really starts with building rapport because that's a really foundational element. Then next, we move into asking questions. And that's where I really think that um, the magic happens in a sales meeting. And so many salespeople are getting that part wrong, right? They just want to show up and throw up usually all over their shoes. But I think as we've seen over, over the past, Pat, that that's just not going to work, right? And so you've got to ask some really great questions. And I think the questions and the depth and the um, level of clarity that you can bring to your prospect through the questions that you ask is really what can separate you from all the also rands and all the other mediocre salespeople out there. And then we move that into what um, you know most people would call the presentation or the demo stage, right? And so that that selling part is really speaking to answers. And so taking all that great knowledge that you um, acquired doing that question asking time, right? Where you're going to be quiet during the question asking time. You're only talking 25% and then you're letting the prospect speak 75% of the time. So you take that information that you learned, then, then what you do is you just basically present that to them in a speaking to answers, right? So you take the information you gathered and then you speak to answers. And I think what's really critical, Pat, is that the conversation that's going on in your prospect's mind, well, that's the most important pro that's the most co important conversation that's currently going on, right? And so that's where I think a lot of salespeople need to tailor their questions and then their answers to it, right? You got to be able to um, think about what's the conversation going on in that prospect's mind because the if you can provide, if you can um, articulate the problems that your prospect is having even better than they think they, they know it or think that they have it, then they're automatically going to think you have the answer. So that's speaking to answers. And then the final is just a win-win. Well, hang, 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 hang on, though, I'm, for one second. You know, people say this. I hear this all the time. But that's actually easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Lots of times, especially if you're like in a startup, you don't know their business better than they do. Lots of times, if you're a new hire to a company, you don't know <laughs> their business better mm -hmm. than they do. They've been living in this business for maybe decades, yet you're trying to sell them something and somebody tells you that this thing that you're selling is value. I, I always think that's just such, such a difficult situation for a lot of sales professionals. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I agree that, you know, if you're coming into a startup with kind of an unproven product, well, yeah, that is going to be difficult for you. And I really think that that's where you got to go that extra step, right? Most salespeople commonly don't want to do the hard things it takes to make selling easy. So in that case, in that situation, you got to go out there and actually go out and visit your clients or your potential clients. Really spend a day in the life if you have to, maybe even two days, right? To really understand what are they going through? What are the issues that they have, right? What's that 30,000 foot mountain and struggle that they have to try to climb to push this, you know, company to the next level. Then also, what's that like pebble, right? What's that like issue that they're having every single day? That's that rock in their shoe as they try to climb that mountain. So I think that's where you really have to go in deep beyond just the, um, you know, general customer avatars that we're so commonly seeing out on the internet. You have to go even much further into really what are, you know, what are, what's a real win for them and really getting to understand their business a little bit better. What about this notion? Like I was just watching the Steve Jobs movie the other day. <laughs> Jobs is it good? <laughs> it was interesting. It, I actually enjoyed the movie, but it, but Mr. Jobs, I mean, I struggle with that man because his notion was the customer doesn't know what they want. You know, I I know what's best for mm -hmm. them, and that just really it just grinds immensely. That grates me 
Yeah, I think wasn't it um, Ford who said if I would have asked the customer, they would have given me a better horse or a faster horse? Yeah, that's actually a myth, but people Is repeat it? that all the time. Yeah, I don't think you ever did say that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that that that's you. You should do a scopes on that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's that idea. It is that idea. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to argue with Steve Jobs. His record stands alone, but I think if you're going to try to sell a product or a service or a widget, maybe that worked for Steve Jobs and Apple, but for the majority of people that are listening to it or, or that I work with, they're not Steve Jobs. They're not Apple. Right. And so what they commonly don't do is understand really who their buyer is and where their buyer is trying to go to, right? Like Steve Jobs, he didn't try to invent a better boom box or anything like that. But what he really provided was um, a, a much more efficient way to listen to music and to access music as well as to give some customization to it. And while it may be tough to pull out elements in your own business, there's no, there's nothing stopping you of moving your service, your product or your widget towards that level. I like that. Good answer. So what's next? And then the last one is really creating the win-win, right? And what a win-win looks like. I think a lot of salespeople really have the misconception that a close is, that's obviously right. That's what everybody's trying to do. But I think that most salespeople get it wrong. And when they say like close is something that I do to someone, right? And that really gives the, like, I'm the victor, you're the vanquished, tough bananas. Like I'm the one who won this deal here. And I think if you're going to have a long-term sales career, if you're going to really want to have a career that transgresses just from a commodity driven salesperson to a trusted advisor approach, which is really the role I want to be in. It's where the role a lot of my customers want to be in. Totally agree. About, totally agree. Right? Yeah. That's where you want to be in Pat. Like that's, I mean, that's where you don't get pinched on your margins. That's where, um, you know, people don't, you know, complain over a $1 price hike. Um, and so, so many companies try, always stay and can never get out of that commoditization because they're not seen as a trusted advisor. They're never looking out for their, for their customer. Um, and so that's really where creating a win-win is. And so a win-win can look at as something as um, it's really just a commitment to a next action or to a next step. So I look at a win-win as scheduling your next meeting, right? Or uh, booking the following demo with maybe the C-suite, or it's actually closing that piece of business. So really trying to define it as what's the most natural next step. So I think you and I are looking at this very, very similar, that your goal is just to keep what I used to call this advancing the sale. Just as long as you're advancing the sale, that it's getting a little closer to a close, that's that's more than enough of a win, that you shouldn't be trying to close them every time you see them, but just advance the sale a little bit more, a little bit farther. Yeah, I totally agree. Um and yeah, that's just the natural progression, right? Like some, I think a lot of people, especially I think between like 80 and 90% of all people aren't ready to buy at that spot, right? Like right now, immediately, they're not ready to just hand over, fork over their credit card or write you a purchase order. So I think that's where really in this next step is, is, hey, you got to create a win-win. You got to provide some value. Then you also got to follow up too, because so many companies are just not doing the follow-up, right? It's either you buy now or I'll never see you again. And that's just not the way modern people are buying buying products right now. Why is this? What? I, I think I read something along the lines that, you know, average person only fo follows up a couple times. But I, I know for a fact that I've had a lot of people follow up with me a m number of times and I'm just too busy to like get back to them. And eventually if they keep at it, I will get back to them. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, I think there's a common misconception. And I was at a speaking engagement earlier today, and someone brought it up. How do I, I don't want to be seen as a pest. I don't want to be seen as a used car salesman. And that's really unfortunate when people have that mentality. They're selling themselves from like their wallet, right? Or they're selling themselves from uh, their position thinking like, well, I don't want to be this. But let's be honest, Pat, the average executive, the average worker nowadays gets what? 150, 200 emails in a given day. I mean, Pat, on a given day, how many emails do you get? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's 100. <clears throat> yeah. 100, right? Yeah. So if, if you think that your one email, like, randomly in the dark is going to make an impact with a CEO or with an executive or with a buying agent. Well, you're just, you're, you're kind of confusing yourself, right? Or you're kind of joking yourself. They get all these emails and that's not to mention social media interaction. That's not to mention phone calls. So if you think just this like one email once out of the clear dark uh, is going to all of a sudden make them have action. Well, I just think you have another thing coming for you. It's just not going to happen. 
Um, so I think that a lot of it is this mental conversation that we tell ourselves of like, well, I don't want to be a pest. They're going to remember me. They're not going to like me. No, your, your buyer, your prospect is busy. They don't remember you. I mean, Pat, I can't tell you how many people like have tried reaching out to me, like with one pitiful email or they tried one phone call. Like I don't remember their names, but just like you were saying before, I do remember the people that followed up with me 10, 15, 20 times. Cause you know what, Pat? I got a life, man. I'm busy, just like you are, right? You've got uh, you've you've got kids. You got grandkids. Those people get sick in your life. Um, you go on vacation. You get busy with the holiday time. So I think people are just taking it way too personal when um, when prospects and buyers don't get back to them. So I'm really glad we've gotten to this point because now I really want to ask the, the real question that I've been wanting to ask: Is the title of this book "Raise Your Standards"? How did you come to that? Oh, well, that's that, you know, that one, I don't know if I'm happy to admit this or uh, I'm nervous to admit this. So I've got a business coach. His name is Craig Ballantyne. He's known as the, he's known as the most disciplined man on the internet. Uh, and he's written, I think, three or four New York Times bestselling um, books. And he's just a wonderful guy, great business coach. And so I had been struggling with the naming of my book. And my publisher was starting to give me a deadline and said, hey, we've got to have this done by like, you know, the days were ticking. I remember having weeks and thinking like, oh, I'll figure this out. And I remember having days being like, what am I going to do with this? And um, I hopped on a call with Craig. And within five minutes, he just said, Oh, yeah, it should be Razor Standards, the definitive guide to building seven figure sales after he learned of my background, after we had talked many times about, you know, kind of how I've helped other companies grow seven figure sales teams and beyond and helped individual sales reps create seven figure sales for them for themselves. So uh, I can't say it's 100 percent my own, but uh, I'm just thankful for Craig and that he came up with uh, the masterful title. But why does it speak to you? Raise your standards. Oh, yeah. So the raise your standards part, I just think that there's so many salespeople that are just settling right now. They're settling for a bunch of tries, right? They're settling for, well, I tried to reach out to the prospect and they said no. I tried to close that deal, but they said no. I tried to make an impact in my life or to really grow my company, but it just never happened. Like, no, we got to trade our tries for dues. And I think that all comes back to the standards, to the line in the sand that you're going to have for yourself. It comes back to the standards that you're going to set and your expectations for, hey, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm not going to allow someone else to dictate my life. And I'm not going to allow someone else's opinion of me to hold me back from anymore. So that's really where that raise your standards comes in mind to me of just um, it's not enough to just sit back as, you know, your career and your life passes you by. You've got to raise your 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 level up. I'm really glad you're talking about this because this is the beginning of the year and this is a good time, I think despite what other people think, I love New Year's resolutions and things of that, of that sort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I know that you have something you called your, your dream board, uh, the big five on your dream board. Maybe you could share a little bit about that. Yeah. Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, so let's start off with the dream board. So this is something that a former boss of mine um, was really famous for. He built a great culture at his company. And so I've adapted it to really to be a sales team. So I'm a big believer in starting any new sales hire, or even if you have a current sales team, you can do this with them, is that you start managing to a dream board. So the dream board really, um, it, it's four quadrants. So imagine that you've got a um, picture of like, or imagine that you take a piece of paper And really what you're doing is you're folding it and creating a big T, right? So you've got a couple of different, um, so you've got four different main boxes. You've got want, do, give, and grow in each of a four box. And then really what you do is you have these individuals fill it out. So the do, right? So the do is the what do you want and what do you want to do and experience, right? And so this is usually like vacations and lifestyle type of things, whether it's heading to South Africa on a safari or sipping a Mai Tai at like a five-star resort. That's a do. The give is how you want to give back to your community. What contributions to the world do you want to make? So I really believe that the world gives to the givers and takes from the takers. Uh, And then grow, right? How do you want to grow and improve yourself? And then the last one is the want, right? The shiny objects, the new cars, the watches, stuff like that. And you have your new salesperson or your veteran salesperson fill this out because what I want sales managers to start doing is to, instead of sitting down with a sales rep, right, that is let's say underperforming instead of saying, well, you're not doing this. You need to do better. What's going on with your calls or your numbers? Well, 
I mean, that only goes so far, right? And some people react to that. And I think it's a real minority, but others, they're just so turned off by it that they start looking for another opportunity or they just shut down and it's not an effective way to manage. So I've used this dream board to effectively manage sales teams. So I have them fill that out. And then if there's an issue with when it comes to their performance, I simply sit down with them. I bring out this dream board and I say, Hey, you know, you talked about how you wanted to achieve this. You wanted to go here. You wanted to treat your family to this. You wanted a new home, et cetera, et cetera. Then, uh, so related to the dream board is really filling out a scorecard, right? So understanding what are the daily activities you need to do every day to achieve what's on your dream board, right? If you want a new truck, well, you got to make X amount of sales, which is going to lead to X amount of commission, which is going to allow you to pay for that truck in cash. So I sit down with the sales rep and I'll just say, hey, you know, are, is your activity in alignment with what your dreams are, right? And then I just be quiet and then I let them respond. So instead of me saying like, hey, you know, Pat, your numbers aren't where they need to be. They're simply saying like, you know what? Uh, I either don't believe in this anymore or no, I need to improve my performance. I need to get my activities number up. These dreams of mine, the, this want, do, give, and grow is really important to me and I've got to make a change. So it's on me. And then I say, yeah, it is on you. All right, so what are we going to do about it? Then we put it together an action plan. So that's really the dream board in a nutshell. What I really like about this is it forces you, or not forces you, but it guides you to focus on the process and falling in love with the process. Absolutely. There's a certain number of metrics and key performance indicators that you're looking at, like how many phone calls did it make? How many emails did they send out? How many people did I, did I connect with on LinkedIn? And if you just kind of fall in love with that, the rest just happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a scorecard is such an underutilized thing when it comes to sales. Because I think a lot of sales teams, they're looking at the lagging indicators. And I would consider lagging indicators being the revenue and the closed deals. Yeah. Because I, I think, Pat, maybe you would agree with this. But yeah. What you do today, you know, in sales, only you'll only see that in sometimes three months, sometimes six months, sometimes nine months, sometimes even longer. So just saying, hey, we're just going to track the revenue or we're just going to be concerned about closed deals. Well, you're, you're not giving yourself a good understanding of what the future is going to look like. You're just reporting on the past. You're not looking at the future. Yeah, I, this is the thing. You know, People do this in the support and the customer experience place all the time. They have the idea that if I, if I take a bunch of customer complaints you know, on the phone and if I start to address all them and I make people really happy and I, and I improve the product so there's less and less of these, over time, by, by just working on this every day, eventually people are going to call less. There's going to be less complaining about this. My support lines are going to be the, the trick for having high quality. Take that same idea in selling. It's just the day-to-day -day stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff of like prospecting. And, and then, as I said before, you know, sending emails, connecting with people and all mm -hmm. that, you know, um, if you just kind of focus on that, the, the rest will happen. Definitely. And, you know, I think it all comes down to, right, like even I think with a lot of salespeople, myself included, when I started in this industry, I did not want a cold call. I did not want a cold email. I did not want to do that hard work, right, that prospecting, that hard work that makes sales easy. Um, and so on days I didn't want to do that, even the dishes looked good, Pat, right? Like, well, maybe I'll stay home and just do the dishes or I'll clean this other mug or maybe I'll vacuum my floor. But I think it's really the individuals who understand like, gosh, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyways because I know that in six months, nine months, I'm going to have a huge payoff are the ones that separate themselves from the mediocre. They raise their standards to be exceptional salespeople. I love it. Mark, how can people find your book? How can they find you online? Well, I can be found on Amazon. That's a little store if, you, if you've heard mm -hmm, of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can be found mostly on, so anybody who gets the book, um, there's a companion guide that goes along with the book and you can find that at www.markpatrickevans and that's evans.com slash book. And that's a great resource to uh, really cement the learning of the book. I agree. I have it right in my hand right now. Hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, this really is terrific. This is good, really good stuff. Mark. Well, thanks, Pat. I appreciate that. Hey, I really appreciate you coming here and babbling with us uh, on the podcast. This has been a ton of fun. The babble was all my pleasure. Welcome back, Craig. Are you ready to babble a sales next to sales tip? I am ready. So what's this week's tip? This week's tip is, wait for it, follow up. Follow up. F-U-P. Yeah, I mean, amazing how poorly most salespeople do at this. You get you get a lead, you call them once, you leave them a voicemail, 
then you get distracted. You got a big deal you're trying to close. Another lead comes in. You got a big sales meeting, a trade show, whatever. And you just forget and you never call back. And man, that's opportunity slipping through your fingers. It is. In fact, I think I read a study the other day that said something. The average person only follows up twice on a lead they get at a trade show. And the average sale is closed after five to seven touches. So there you go. All you got to do is just get organized and figure out a way to make sure that you reach out to them between five and 10 times. Depends on what business and who you're calling on and all that. But just make sure. It doesn't all have to be calls. It could be some of it could be emails, um, but stay in front of them. And when they when you get into the sales process and you're sending proposals and things like that, and they say, "Okay, great. Well, we're going to take this to our management meeting at the end of next week, and I'll get back to you uh, after that." Don't just wait, right? Check in with the guy a few days later. Hey, uh, I know you're presenting the proposal here next week, but I, now that you've had a chance to look it over, I just want to see if you had any questions or anything else that, that you need going into the meeting. Stay in touch. Maintain that communication. That's building trust and keeping you top of mind versus your competitors. I love it. I love it. If people want to find these sales tips, they're online, aren't they? Absolutely. You just go to salesnexus.com slash sales and there you can download a pdf of all of the sales babble sales tips and get a free copy of our market our four steps to market domination guide sounds good sounds good well thanks a lot for visiting us again here on sales babble craig i really appreciate it can't wait for next week's tip thank you i'll see you next week To connect with Mark Evans, you can find him and links to his book and to his website at www.salesbabble.com slash 306, as well as links to Craig Klein's Sales Nexus Sales Tips. You can find them, too. I'd really appreciate if you'd check out our sponsor. If you got a question or a comment about this episode or one of Craig's sales tips, don't hesitate to reach out and contact me either on LinkedIn or on the website. You can click the Babble Me button that will go directly. I'll send an email directly to me. I would love to hear from you. If you could share a five-star review about us, that would be really great. That's how we get the word out when it comes to podcasts. It's all about referrals, the referral business. That's all I got for today, folks. Until next Tuesday, take care and have a highly successful and a profitable selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble podcast. Find us at www.salesbabble.com. This is a production of Abenero Media.